Established in 1994 by the government of the Bahamas, the Parliamentary Channel 40 broadcast gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the proceedings of both houses of parliament, providing up-to-date information, including live interviews and historical data on the workings of one of the most important branches of government. Anthony Dubo, welcome to the Parliamentary Channel's live coverage of the House of Assembly. First day back after the summer break. Members are going to church today, as the leader of government business uh, told the nation this morning. Uh, they're going to come into the House, uh, lay some documents on the table. Uh, possibly there will be some communications. And for those of you watching, you want to tell those who are not watching now, but We'll have an opportunity to do it later on. Of course, livestream.com slash ZNS Bahamas, live, online. And of course, you can go to our website, ZNSBahamas.com. Of course, we are live on Radio 1540, Radio 810, and 104.5. All of that in addition, of course, to the parliamentary channel. There are going to be some communications. And uh, there are going to be some interesting communications is the best way for me to put it. Lots of things have happened over the summer break, and uh, you want to stay tuned for what happens when members meet at 10 o'clock. Also, we understand the Leader of the Opposition is having a press conference this morning. We don't know what that's about. Of course, we know that he recently named a new senator, former Education Minister and former Holy Cross Member of Parliament, Carl Bethel. He's the new Leader of Opposition Business in the Senate whenever the Senate returns. Dr. Menace, the leader of the opposition, of course, is expected to be back in the House when it meets uh, this morning. One of the things that happened before the summer break, of course, Dr. Menace was named and suspended. Uh, again, we will see what happens this morning when House members meet. Again, some communications this morning. Members will then suspend, go to church at St. Agnes uh, in commemoration of the 284th anniversary of Parliament. We also plan to have a documentary. We're waiting for one or two more persons to make a contribution to that piece that we're putting together uh, for Sunday. This service today, we will record that service and we'll give you an opportunity to see it on Sunday. You'll be able to hear it live on Radio 1540. Again, when members last met, one of the things that they dealt with, in fact, that last day they passed several bills. Uh, but around that time, what was on top of everybody's minds was, of course, the stem cell debate. The prime minister had, he wasn't able to make his presentation the day that he wanted, but he did eventually make uh, uh, presentation, and he, he actually spoke about more than stem cell. Dr. Nottage also had a contribution that he made during that same time. We're going to let you listen to some of both of them. We're going to begin this morning, though, with Prime Minister Christie, the last time members met here in the House of Assembly. And ministers do not unilaterally close down clinics. They do so in furtherance of the decision of the government of the Bahamas at the time to do the right thing with respect to the reputation of this country. And let me take you further, sir. As my government desired a reputable jurisdiction, we stopped the work being done by Okeanos pending the establishment of a new legislative regime. And as proposals came in, we advised that all consideration was on hold pending the passage into law of new legislation. There was no rush. Instead, there was a deliberate, considered point of view that the importance of this and what we were doing was sufficiently in the, or manifestly in the best interest of the country that we did not wish to make mistakes. Mr. Speaker, I recall saying to the Minister of Health, 
But let us appoint a task force. Let us put people who we regarded as reputable members of the profession, licensed and, and, and approved and certified. And we invited a Dr. Porter to take the chair. Up to that time, as a former prime minister, I had seen Dr. Porter, Porter and his partner, Conwell Brown and other partners he had in the provision of a cancer treatment center. I had seen them become the only certified center outside of the United States by the American Cancer Association. I had seen them go into jurisdictions in the Caribbean. I had read of discussions they were having with other universities. I'd seen them go into Turks and Caicos, into Antigua, into St. Kitts. The governments were approving them. The leaders of the opposition today even extended himself further by suggesting Dr. Porter was a big donor of the PLC in his press out there. And I don't know, Mr. Speaker, who he gave money to. But let me just say this. We saw him at the time as a professional who had headed up McGill University Medical School, who was a member of the Privy Council appointed by the Prime Minister of Canada to be chairman of the National Security Commission of Canada. That's what we saw him as. All for the record, we saw him as an investor who had received permanent residence in the Bahamas. We saw him as someone who his fellow practitioners accepted as someone worthy of support. This government, we do not, Mr. Speaker, knowingly make the wrong decision. That's not our intention. And I want to be able to tell people at this table that when the issue came up, I reminded my colleagues that I served as a minister of health before. Yeah. I reminded them of a time in the Bahamas when body bags were leaving the Bahamas because people were coming here looking for a last chance to be helped. <laughs> that people were exploiting them. This prime minister, this former Minister of Health had that experience, and he shared that experience with his colleagues around the cabinet table, yeah. saying no matter what the cost yeah. and what kind of trouble we put investors to, right. our new government must do it right. We will not proceed any further until we put in place rules and regulations that will govern the use of stem cells research on stem cell therapy in the Bahamas. <laughs> the leader of the opposition decided to take the debate down the wrong road. He, had, he argued that the legislation was being passed for the benefit of a particular person living in the West. And I presume he's talking about Peter Nygaard, that's clear. And the proposition seemed to have been fueled by a tape of, of Nygaard claiming victory and that we won the country back in the presence of some of my colleagues. I believe, Mr. Speaker, I verily believe that the fact that I was not present on that occasion, and therefore not on the tape, caused them to make a decision to involve me, because you got to get the head. And that this whole affair was because I was not present, I was not there, and they needed to get me. 
Proposition number one that I want to put here. Mr. Speaker, I have the privilege, I've had the privilege of inviting all of these new young men and young women into public life. I've had the privilege of interviewing them and speaking to them about their future. And I have done so as someone who has spent, next year will make 40 years in public life, two years as a senator and the rest as a member of this house. And I've spoken to them about the extraordinary circumstance of the Bahamas, where, as the member for Golden Gate said, there is a double standard. Even the Tribune acknowledged. Yes, Mr. Christie talked about one standard for the other. We, we, have, we have to acknowledge that we have to watch the PLP more than we watch the FNM. <laughs> Uh, yes, a tribune and editor. Yeah. Yeah. Who was watching them the last five years? Yeah. I, I make this point so to say this. That I have been around long enough to be able to say to my colleagues, we cannot afford to be distracted. Yeah. That, that the cost of victory <laughs> is so incredibly exacting because you have to recognize the impatience of people who elected you, their inability to accept the time, that we must be given time, and that everything is constantly moving. And that the job of the opposition is to disrupt that, to cause people to think of other things, to create this challenge that <laughs> Christie is corrupt. Christie ordered the police to prosecute Cole Smith and, and Freddie Smith for me, Perry. <laughs> I walked into my cabinet and told my colleagues that I resented the fact that a former colleague of mine was charged and no one told me. But yet, I was being placed in a position where as Prime Minister, a learned QC was saying that I was manipulating the police force in that way. That is total disrespect, Mr. Speaker. Total disrespect. And if left alone, it causes people to have a jaundiced view of us. I want my colleagues to know that in 1992 when the PLP lost, I inherited the office of the person who became Prime Minister. He couldn't clean his office up good enough. So there were papers that were left in place that allowed me to see what was going on. Mr. Speaker, I know who the people are in Lightfoot Key who raises the money for the FNM. <laughs> I know the people who cause there to be a jaundiced view, a bad view of the PLT. I know who they are. I know who they are. I know who they go to. I know who gives money to them. I've been around long enough to be able to find out in my own way, but also to see the evidence of it. And Mr. Speaker, we're going to have the opportunity to examine the recommendations of the Constitution Commission. And we're going to have the opportunity to determine for ourselves what kind of Bahamas we want and what recommendations we will accept. But until such time, Mr. Speaker, political donations are lawful. And as I will show you, sir, 
Peter Nagar's history in the Bahamas began with a reference from Sir David Knowles and Mr. Peter Johnstone. When the law firm of Higgs and Johnson was asking for him, they recommended him for permanent residence. No, Peter Johnstone, Jeffrey was a lawyer. But they recommended him as one with great means and what he was then in the UVP orbit. And I will come back to it, Mr. Speaker, because it's important to let you know that whilst he was in the UVP orbit, all was well. I don't get, see, I don't get to know. I, I once took a delegation out to his house where they were having a party, and I saw the FNM ministers, they were in power, Minister of Tourism, member found who FN was with me. And I saw every major investor in the Bahamas there, Sol Kirsten and the rest of them, having fun. So all the women, I tell the fellas, this ain't the place for us to be. Because I always knew what is the place for us to be and what not to be. I told them, let's leave. They're having party. They're having fun. Once Peter Nygaard called me and he said, um, Mr. Christie, I have Robert De Niro coming to the Bahamas. He's a movie star. I would like you to meet him for me because it is difficult for me to come and I want him to know he's accepted in the Bahamas, Robert De Niro. I didn't go by myself. I called <laughs> young Gray Davis, the member of parliament for Cat Island. I said, come go with me please because we're going to meet Robert De Niro. I always wanted to be prime minister and I was always mindful of the snares and the traps that you could get caught up in. Very cautious. People, very, very, I'm always like that. I went out, went out there when the FNM fellas were really enjoying themselves and I had to stand on the porch. And I remember telling Debbie Bartlett, I don't know if she remembers, Mr. Speaker, do not let me yield to temptation. If you see me yielding, hold my hand. I once said that to her, right out there. And I left. <laughs> But I do that, Mr. Speaker, with investors over the years. So let me tell you how it began. So Lyndon Tinling turned to me in 1991 and said, Terry, you have been arguing for a long time that we should get to know investors. He said, I want you to meet with certain investors. One is a lawyer, um, Jeff Johnson is a lawyer, the next one, Peter Graham is the lawyer. I want you to meet with them and talk with them. That's how I met Peter Nagar. That's why I speak so authoritatively. I don't think he could ever say to you, I have asked him to donate to my political campaign. But when he does, I'm pleased because it's lawful. I've always told the press, whether it's about people who, Craig Flowers and I went to school together, from we were children. His brother died, Arnold, and I went to the funeral. We were children together. I don't care what people say about the relationship I have with people, once I do not cross the line in that relationship, do not have, have people have the wrong impression about it, but when it comes down to the laws of the Bahamas, confidentiality. I've taken a position, Mr. Speaker, that investors do not want me to say who they have donated to. And let me go further, sir. I have had in writing <laughs> leading FNM personalities who have donated to the PLC cause and who have told me, I know you will exercise your discretion because I am not a supporter of your party and how you handle it. <laughs> in one case, a very, very leading one said, because you are a good prime minister, a good man. <laughs> That's what he said. 
And, and this is no exaggeration. This is the Bahamas. This is the Bahamas. Do you know the enormity of the decision the members of South Africa made? Do you all recognize that? He speaks in a debate and says he is for stem cells. He knows, Mr. Speaker, that one of the significant areas of research will be the cardiologist. And he is a heart patient. He knows that all of these applications have leading cardiologists, professors from you know, leading universities, Mr. Speaker, and he knows the significance of it. That's why he supported it. And he's at a stage of his life where he cannot face the contradiction of saying yes and then being asked to say no. And I will take you step by step through the process of the application of Opiano. And I will ask you step by step to tell me what's in the mind of a Minister of Health, a former Minister of Health, who would lead his ministry into making a decision of the kind he made without any regulations, any law, and even the most rudimentary test as to the fitness of an individual to invest in the Bahamas. Not even that. And I'm going to ask you, what do you think the consideration was for that kind of approval? Since he's talking about me, I'm going to ask you, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I make a proposition that the Ministry approved, the Ministry of Health approved Akianus with no controls and levels of accountability in place, without the normal security and intelligence clearances, and that the way in which it was done leads to major questions as to why the usual investigations did not take place and who was the person or persons benefiting from this process. That was Prime Minister Christie and his contribution to the debate on stem cell and again addressing any number of other issues that needed to be spoken to during that time. Again, members are going to come to the House meet briefly and then suspend and go on over to St. Agnes where there's going to be a service in commemoration of the 284th anniversary of Parliament. They will return to the House of Assembly at 3 o'clock to conduct some business, but the real substantive business uh, won't really begin. That is the plan anyway until next Wednesday the 9th when members return here to the House. Also making a contribution, obviously, to the debate on stem cell was Dr. himself, leader of government business in the House, the member for Baines and Grantstown, the Honorable Dr. Bernard Nottage, also the Minister of National Security. Let's listen to some of what Dr. Nottage had to say during his presentation. I spoke about something called distraction. And he pointed out to us that every time... There was something good about to happen in the Bible. There would always be the distraction, trying to get us off theme, off focus, Mr. Speaker. And it is the way, that way in this country. Every time the government of the people are promoting something for the benefit of the people, there are the distractions yes, which are painted across the board. There are the detractors, as the member says, who seek to diminish the importance of what you are seeking to do in order to discredit you. And, and the, I'll give you another distraction. Just now somebody handed me something written by the member from Sudani. 
Sarai, the love of a bear does. Influence you. <laughs> the love of a God knows. <laughs> to say what he said. <laughs> that the that the member for Senegal was corrupt. <laughs> to say, suggesting that we are seeking to stop him from talking. He had his full That's term right. yeah, during the debate, Mr. Speaker. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he made a number of accusations with which I will deal today, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Push yeah. man up. He couldn't wait. Normally, the leader of the opposition would wait yeah. to hear what his members are saying, to hear what members of the government are saying, so that he could provide a leadership yeah. response to the case. But oh no. He wanted to be first out the gate. And he was. But Mr. Speaker, before I deal with him, I want to congratulate the mover in this debate, the honorable member. Yes, sir. Because it was so long ago that we may have forgotten the excellent presentation that he made, Mr. Speaker, in which he outlined the fundamental tenets of this bill. Remember now, we are not debating NIGAD. We're not debating corruption. We're debating the importance of stem cells, research, and therapy, and what it can do not only for Bahamians, but for humanity, Mr. Speaker, and the role that we might be able to play in this development. But I congratulate the movement, Mr. Speaker. Outline the fundamental tenets and the impact that it can have on health care on health research, on health education and therapy for a multitude of illnesses and medical conditions for which today there is no treatment or, or there is inadequate treatment. In his presentation, Mr. Speaker, he set out clearly an understanding of the potential downside of the research and treatment of stem cells, but he also set out in detail the processes, the methods, the personnel, and the infrastructure that will be put in place to prevent any unethical inappropriate practices, and to protect the general public, including donors and recipients in stem cell research and therapy. Yes, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition, a scientist and all that, and I always say a good one at that, erroneously in my view, spent the majority of his time belly aching about the lack of capacity of Bahamians Listen now, to undertake such research and therapy, and of course, the inability of the Bahamas to provide the regulatory environment and our institutions or personnel to monitor, evaluate, or regulate the industry, for want of a better term. That was a speaker, 44 years ago. I graduated in medicine. 44 years. I thought I don't listen. <laughs> That's a long time, remember. I returned back here 39 years ago to practice medicine in the Bahamas. 39 years. Mr. Speaker, 39 years ago, you could talk that stuff you were talking. We don't have the people, we don't have the experience, we don't have the facilities, we don't have the capacity. But this is too sad and Satan for God's sake. Here we go. You know, in Second Kings, question is asked: What must I do? Just be here and die, or must I try to improve? Yes, so right. Speak. Stick with my, my society, Stick with my condition. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Hey, what must I do? Yes, sir. Just wait here and die? What must we do in the Bahamas? What do we have to do to convince these not at this time people? Oh yeah, yeah. That is at this time yes, every time. Yes, you got it. You got it. You got it. You got it. Why are we doing this to ourselves? Why are we continually telling ourselves we cannot do? Good God Almighty, I thought every behavior was a yes I can type yes, of person today. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Mr. Speaker, I came here a few months ago, I think it was, and said that when the Bahamian students went down south to 
expertise in the medical research to present their paper. The Bahamian students had the best papers in the entire Caribbean. Yes. Yes. We couldn't say that 44 years ago. That was 50? Mr. we turning out the doctors at the Princess Margaret Hospital. We couldn't say that 14 years ago. We're progressing, Mrs. Vega, and what gets me is the member for Kilani is a part of that progressive progress. Can you say progressive progress? You would say progressive. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mrs. Vega, really, according to him, he's opposed to the Bahamas being involved in stem cell research and therapy at this time because, A, the Bahamas has yet to receive an ideal primary health care service for its citizens. B, we have no indication that the facility will be adequately staffed. C, in an article in a national magazine, you all remember the magazine? The Bahamas is mentioned among roads, rogue states engaged in stem cell therapy. My name is Speaker. That was a reference to a case quoted in Good Housekeeping magazine, which referred to a case 13 years ago when his government the FNM, his party, the FNM, was a government. And they allowed unregulated right. and apparently fraudulent stem cell therapy in which the complainant said that she had paid some $25,000 with Paul Trump. Now, now, he tried to make it look in here as if what he was reading was some medical or scientific journal and that the period about which they were speaking was today. But the PLP's record with respect to stem cell therapy in the Bahamas is that when the Minister of Health in, in the last PLP government discovered that there were practices going on in Grand Bahama which were inappropriate, inappropriate and unregulated, he closed the operation down. And his position was until there were adequate regulations, until the people doing the work were authentic, until they were properly qualified, until they were properly certified, it couldn't go on, Mr. Speaker. Stem cell research and therapy, if it is to be safe, ethical, and respected by the international medical profession, must meet international standards and protocols and be open to independent scrutiny, Mr. Speaker. He's saying, I don't understand why there's the rush. Where will the research take place? Will this highly skilled suspect? No. If you want to know where will the research take place, I want him to tell me. When he approved Okeanos, That's right. where was the research supposed to take place? He approved it. He approved it. When they decided that the original facility in which they were going to do the work was not appropriate. When he referred the Okeanos okay, okay, people to the doctor in Nassau, who was resident in Nassau to be supervising the work in Grand Bahama, where was the research supposed to take place? He wanted to know whether the highly skilled subspecialty employee employed behaviors, how many work permits will be issued to be employed as head specialist. How many Bahamians will benefit from research in the next five to fifteen years? The question I asked is, did he ask that question and he gave approval? The answer is no. But we are different. We are different. Distinctively different. Because the member for North Andres and the Barry Islands, when he presented me with a copy of the bill, he presented me with a draft copy of the regulations too. And everybody would admit that that's an unusual that's right. practice in this problem, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the opposition said that he hardly believes that we can expect short or medium term financial gains. And wanted to know does the government expect that this research will produce a new tax? He said the Bahamian people know that we cannot even enforce seatbelt laws. 
He said in the early years we were known as bootleggers. During the 80s we were known as drug pushers. And we were classified as a nation for sale and today we are selling false hope. But I want the leaders of the opposition to know that this is a different day. We are a different government. And no matter how many times they tell the repeated lie, the fact of the matter is that the government led by Honorable Member for Senator has set a standard that we will not waver from. Of a set of principles, when we said Bahamians first, we meant Bahamians first. Doesn't mean Bahamians only, because there are some skills that we do not yet have. There are some facilities that we do not yet have. There are even some capacities which we do not yet have. But what do you want me to do? Wait here till I die? Or do you want us to build it? You want us to seek the support for us. And that is precisely what we are doing, Mr. Speaker. The Minister, in his presentation, Member for North Andros and the Berrian, spoke of the importance of a sound ethical oversight committee and indicated that the required personnel are not domiciled in the Bahamas and that it would be necessary to attract and engage very specialized experts to strengthen and enhance what exists locally to build what he calls a robust, internationally, professionally respected cadre of individuals in the area of research. That's what he Very said. Clear. The principle, Mr. Speaker. Very clear. He spoke of the opportunity that is being created to welcome the return of Bahamian scientists. And all you have to do is travel toward the United States and Europe, and you will find them, Mr. Speaker. We believe, we believe they don't exist. But we don't know what happened in 1967. Right. When the, a decision was made to give every Bahamian child an education. Right. Long before George Bush said it, they said, leave no child behind. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Mr. Speaker, as a result of that, oh, we've had failures, without a doubt. But we have a tremendous cadre of Bahamian academics and professionals spread throughout this world. Oh, I'll take it. So what we want to do, Mr. Speaker, is return, welcome the return of Bahamian scientists from across the globe to contribute in the development of science in the Bahamas and in projects such as this. He stated, I'm speaking about the minister now, that the facilities would have to be state-of-the-art, which meet international accreditation, and that participating professionals would have to be certified with licenses to perform the specific tasks in which they would be engaged. Mr. Speaker, right now, in the Bahamas, we have, in the member for North Anderson, I don't want you all to sleep on this, one of the foremost Caribbean, uh, American in his widest sense, global professionals in the field of HIV and AIDS. Well, I remember when he started on his journey, you know, yeah. when he started on his journey. I don't think he knew where it would take him. But if you want an, an example of what can happen with someone working in the Bahamas, with Bahamians, with a zeal, for healthcare, with a passion for superb medical practice, and with the willingness, Mr. Speaker, to sacrifice monetarily to put in place what is needed to counteract AIDS in this community. There he is. Google the name. The point I'm making is, if he could do it in HIV and AIDS, other Bahamians could do it in stem cell research and therapy. Recognized right. internationally by the Clinton Foundation. You know, I, I was jealous of him a little bit, you know. Because, <laughs> you know, when Bill Clinton was calling Perry, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. You understand? <laughs> Recognize internationally, Mr. Speaker. But these Bahamians with these picayune minds, yeah. who believe that. Picayune kind of minds. Picayune minds. Picayune. Who don't believe we could do anything. That's right. I, I wish we could help them. I wish we could help them. You know, when, when the Honorable Minister, former Minister, Member Fukulani was talking about telemedicine, he used to, he used to giggle, but he, he was on to something. He was on to something. Okay? So why seek now to diminish uh, this very important initiative? Mr. Speaker, there are opportunities, economic opportunities, there are health benefits uh, for Bahamians. There are higher paying jobs. There are considerable. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, we have in, in, in the Parliament the member who just walked in has a daughter. Yeah. A daughter yeah. who is an extremely intelligent the member for North Anderson the Barriers, with whom she works, say she's brilliant. I understand. That was Dr. Bernard Nottage and some of his contributions contribution during the debate on the stem cell research and therapy bill. I want to welcome the listeners from Radio 1540, the National Voice, Radio 810 in Grand Bahama, and of course 104.5 to the broadcast. We also streaming livestream.com slash ZNS Bahamas, and of course you can go to our website ZNSBahamas.com. Just for your information, in case you didn't know, when the House last met, there were no members of the opposition there. They sat out in protest, along with the suspension of the leader, Dr. Hubert Minnis, the member for Kalani, who had been named and suspended from the House. They are here in the chamber today. Again, we expect that they will lay some documents on the table, several communications, and then on to St. Agnes at 11 for a church service marking the 284th anniversary uh, Parliament, and then they will return here at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Let's go now and join them in the House as they prepare to begin Something this morning's like session. With you. A good man. The old King James says perfect, but this is the verse. Now there was a day, there was a day, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From whence do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? Son of God, sons of God. In the generic sense, it means that the women are included, sons and daughters of God. As a matter of fact, one of our most successful devotionals is called Sons and Daughters of God. So we're all part of God's family. Never forget it. Your accent may not be the same as mine. Your color may not be as brown as mine. But we're all God's children. And as we begin the session this morning, I invite you to remember your brother, your sister, on either side, we are sons of God. And may he bless you today as you begin this new session. And when you read the commentary on this Job, it says that this indicates that these representatives that came together came at the beginning of a year. These representatives in Job, they came at the beginning of a session like you're doing this morning. And I'm so glad that God spared us to be alive, to begin again. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the lives you have given to us, for the blessings that have been ours since last we met together here. We humbly beseech thee to grant us your wisdom, grant us your discernment, your understanding, your love and unity, that as we begin this session, Lord, we will do it with the knowledge that we are the children of God. 
forgive us our past mistakes and grant us new mercies for this new day and this new time and bless our people everywhere. Bless the youth of the country as they go through this youth month. Bless the leaders in every phase of government beginning with our prime minister and his cabinet. Now today we surrender the agenda of today's house under your care and ask your blessing on our speaker and everyone who contributes and those who sit in the gallery. Give us a good day, a good session, and by thy grace, when our labors on earth are done, may we hear you say to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant, for we humbly pray in the name of Jesus who taught us when we pray to say together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you very much. Good morning, honorable members. I'd certainly like to welcome each and every one of you, including our visitors, back to this honorable House of Assembly from a brief summer recess. Today is Wednesday, the 2nd of October in the year of our Lord, 2013. And today we begin a new sitting of this honorable house. It is my understanding that there's an active agenda that's, uh, that's awaiting us and we will certainly begin with that at some point in our proceedings today. 284 years ago, on the 24th, 29th day of September, this parliament convened for the first time not too far away from this location. In celebration, though, of this milestone, we will commem commemorate a service of thanksgiving today at 11 a.m. at St. Agnes Anglican Church. I am certain the Member of Parliament at some point this morning will give us further indication that, and the Leader of this House will apprise you of our suspension. By way of announcement, this month represents National Youth Month and we are delighted to have visiting with us in celebration of National Youth Month the Chairperson and her team of the Progressive Young Liberals. Visiting with us today, please. We're always delighted to have young people with us. Deshante Benaby, the chairperson, Felicia Woods, Kim Clark, Janae Meadows, Christopher Farrington, David Benaby, Hedley Smith, Wade Stubbs, Ajiki Placaris. Lakel Ferguson, and Shakara Davis. We are delighted to have you join us this morning. <laughs> Honorable members, before I ask the member for Bain and Grandstown to apprise us of today's proceedings, a communication. On Monday, August 12, 2013, the Member of Parliament for Tall Pines, during his contribution to the Supreme Court Amendment debate, inferred some responsibility for his son's death to a private citizen. This was indeed unfortunate. 
The member for Tall Pines' words were published in the press. The private citizen took exception to what Tall Pines said, and understandably, there was public outrage. I'm happy the matter got a good public airing. Perhaps the chair can assist the discourse by attempting to clear up some publicly held misconceptions about our parliamentary institution, and secondly, supplement my personal reflections as, as a citizen and a member of parliament. Our parliament operates under a system of principles, rules, conventions, and traditions. A member's freedom of speech and debate in this house is protected by all of these. In other words, a member's freedom of speech is absolute when he is debating in the Honorable House. Kindly note a direct quote from the 24th edition of Erskine May's Parliamentary Practice, Chapter 13, page 222, under the heading, Privilege of Freedom of Speech. Subject to rules of order in debate, a member may state whatever he thinks fit in debate, however offensive it may be to the feelings or injurious to the character of individuals, and he is protected by this privilege from action for liable as well as from any other question or molestation." End quote. For the information of the public at large, I wish to state that May's parliamentary practice is the authority to which we turn on matters where rules of procedure is silent. In fact, the principle of parliamentary privilege dates back to the UK, United Kingdom, Bill of Rights of 1689. Most Commonwealth countries and even the United States have adopted the principle of freedom of speech, which is entrenched and holds the parliament or Congress ought not be impeached or questioned in any court or place outside of parliament. Having said that, I would now like to assert that it is a sacred set of privileges members of this honorable house do enjoy. These privileges are unique to parliamentarians and they are not enjoyed by members of the public. Attached to these privileges, however, is the assumption of a certain level of responsibility and decorum. Because this assumption is a fixed one, a member of parliament who deliberately or inadvertently falls below a reasonable standard of conduct diminishes the entire institution. Members, therefore, ought never to yield to the temptation of abusing the sacred privileges of this honorable house, no matter how tempting the prospect. I say this because in the aftermath of what took place, the honorable member reported to have said that it was not his intention to infer what was widely reported to have been said. As a member of our community, an elected representative of a body of citizens, I completely understand the public's outrage at the time, and I wish to register my personal displeasure as, as to what was said. It is unfortunate, too, that it was unchallenged by any of the other members present at that time. I wish to extend my personal apologies to the person who was defamed, and also to the general public for this unfortunate incident. I wish to advise honorable members that incidents of this nature ought never to occur again in this honorable place. I implore all members to shoulder their responsibility to keep debates at a standing standard befitting of high office. My duty as chair is not only to protect members from and chastise members for the violence of words and the lack of compliance of rules, I am also duty bound to keep parliamentary debates to an acceptable standard. In pursuance of these solemn duties, I also seek to protect those who we represent from unwarranted verbal attacks in this place. Members need to understand that this absolute freedom of speech that we enjoy should always be tempered with a measure of self-restraint recognizing the individual rights of private citizens in the spirit of natural law. 
I also note the timely recommendations in the recent Constitutional Commission's report, which speaks to the need for private citizens who have some meaningful form of redress when they feel aggrieved due to libelous or defamatory statements by members. I implore the House to consider adopting some version of this recommendation as part of our rules or establishing a recommendation in legislation. That said, I would like to offer this caveat. In spite of the potential for irrevocable damage to individual private citizens, the unqualified freedom of speech that members of parliament enjoy in debate is vital to the workings of this institution. To get rid of it, as some have suggested, will be tantamount to throwing out the baby with the bathwater. While I appreciate that there is probably a need for further explanation to the statement made by the Honorable Member for Tall Pines, I have to hold fast to the important principle that armed him with the right to make it. From where I sit, I can absolutely see the necessity of freedom of speech in Parliament. For further information of the public, I wish to say this. The House presented this Speaker with a set of unique rules of procedure upon his election to the chair. There is a spirit, letter, and intent of these rules. All speakers are bound by the same rules. While it may appear as though the Speaker is master of the House, I wish to disabuse your mind of that notion. The House has given its Speaker a wide range of powers to control its debate, but in the final analysis, the Speaker is servant of this House. And as servant, therefore, I was disappointed that a private citizen with no recourse to justice was defamed. And as a result of this occurrence, and upon reflection, I feel a moral sense of duty to make amends with notwithstanding the fact that the damage was done. Consequently, I do hereby order that the statement made by the Honorable Member for Tall Pines with respect to the highlighting of the name of the individual be expunged from the records of this House. For complete clarity, I wish to attempt to explain what expungement means within the context. Firstly, be advised that it is, what is said on the floor of this House is always kept on some electronic record. It becomes a part of the historic record for posterity. When the chair orders an expungement, it not only speaks to the prohibition of the expunged words being cited in the press, it also removes the offending words from the official records. If the press chooses to publish the words after they have been ordered expunged, this act will be regarded as an affront to the authority of the chair. Additionally, it means that the press loses its privilege and protection of freedom of speech by reporting something in violation of the House rules. The press would therefore be subject itself to libel and defamatory laws and penalties from the chair. I accept that the rules and procedures of the House have not yet caught up to the technological realities of today. This is an issue of which many parliaments throughout our Commonwealth are grappling with. Secondly, the purpose for expungement, expungement is to protect the dignity and decorum of the House as a responsible arm of the government by the people and for the people. Finally, it is important to note that the Honorable Member has no obligation to speak further to this issue. But if indeed, as has been reported in the press, he feels his words were misconstrued, the Chair would offer him every opportunity to leave no doubt in anybody's mind as to what his true intents were. The Chair, however, has no authority nor desire to deprive any member of the ancient privilege bestowed upon him by this parliament. In closing, honorable members, I often reflect on my maiden communication upon my election as speaker 
on May 23, 2012. Inspired then, as I am today, I cited a principle found in Second Chronicles when Solomon stood before the altar and offered a burnt offering. That night God appeared to Solomon and he said to him, ask for whatever you want. Solomon answered him, you have shown great kindness to my father David and made me king in this place. Give me wisdom and knowledge that I may lead this people who is able to govern this great people of yours. I think the Lord was impressed. Because he, for, for the wisdom and knowledge to govern the people over whom you have made me king. The Lord therefore granted him wisdom and knowledge granted to him. And I would also give you wealth, possessions, and honor such that no king who was before you has ever received or will ever in the future. Honorable members, let us therefore serve our country from this lofty place with our unique rules of engagement, but most importantly, with the spirit of Solomon. Honorable members, we will now continue with the proceedings. And if the chair is the chair is minded to hear from the member for Baines and Grandstown at this time, the chair will entertain. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Bain and Grandstown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, it is our intention today to attend the church service sponsored by yourself, which commemorates the 284th anniversary of the Parliament. The service is to be held at St. Agnes Church and is due to start at 11 a.m. I have made arrangements for members who wish it to be transported to the church by bus and to be brought back to the chamber by bus after the service is completed. It is our intention to resume Parliament at 3 p.m., at which time the government will make a number of communications and to Parliament and any other business that is uh, relevant, and then it is our intention to adjourn the House and to come back next week, Wednesday, on the 9th of October. Very well. Thank you, Honorable Member. By way of further announcement for the Honorable Members, the Church Service is expected to conclude at about 12.30, 12.45, thereabouts. Uh, refreshments will be provided here at the house by 1 p.m. For those who are interested in lunch, it will be provided for at 1 p.m. Motion for suspension. So the house is now suspend until 3 p.m. on the 2nd of October, 2013. Do we have a second? Second. It's moved and seconded that the business of this house suspends until 3 p.m. this afternoon on Wednesday the 2nd, 2013. As many in favor will remain seated, and those opposed will stand. The business of this house suspends until 3 p.m. this afternoon. All right. Well, one communication this morning, the speaker, uh, speaking directly to the communication by the member for Tall Pines, and again, we know what transpired. We're not going to uh, rehash that. Members return at 3 this afternoon. Again, of course, they're going to St. Agnes for a church service, as we told you earlier. That church service, by the way, will be heard live on Radio 1540. It will be recorded for television to be broadcast on Sunday night. Again, house here suspended until 3 o'clock this afternoon. Members uh, about to attend church service at St. Agnes, Anakin Church on Blue Hill Road. They will return here at 3. 
then documents would be laid on the table. And as the leader of government business uh, said, the substantive debate on those documents, whatever they lay on the table, will happen next week on October the 9th. That's it from here in Parliament. We'll see you back here at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Thank you.